We're absolutely delighted to welcome to High Performance the founder of the wearable tech brand Whoop. They've been previous partners with us on High Performance. It was amazing, actually. We spoke about them and hundreds of people went out and bought them and then got in touch to tell us they loved it. So uh, it's only right that we should talk to Will about how it was all created and where he's at today. Will, thank you so much for joining us from the United States. Jake, Damien, thank you guys for having me. So listen, we always start our interviews in exactly the same way. In your mind, what is high performance? I think high performance is exceptional output delivered consistently. You know, I think at various points in my life when I was thinking about high performance personally, I would view it as sort of a singular thing. Like you have a, a, a great result or, uh, you, you know, you win the game or you, you score well on a test and it's sort of a, it's an individual performance, right? A singular moment. And the more time that I've spelled, spent building a business as an entrepreneur who's trying to perform at a high level. And then also because Whoop works with many of the best athletes in the world being around really great athletes, the more I've appreciated that high performance is also uh, consistency day in, day out. Wow, so tell us where that originally came from then, because I think if I asked the 18 year old you what is high performance, it would have been different. Can you remember when you first started that journey to learning it's about being relentless, but it's about being consistently relentless? Well, I was always into sports and exercise growing up. You know, I, I probably played a dozen different sports as a young athlete. I went on to play squash while I was at Harvard. And so I was a competitive college athlete. And I would say that my perspective on performance as say, you know, 20 and younger was always, uh, okay, I've got a, you know, an upcoming match, an upcoming game. Like I'm going to try to win that. And it was less about where I am today and or in this moment, and more about, uh, can I win that thing coming up? And it didn't really matter to me if I sort of ran myself into the ground along the way or, uh, you know, uh, wasn't necessarily optimal in other aspects of my life. As a college athlete, I was someone who struggled with overtraining, uh, which is, you know, a phenomenon many listeners are probably familiar with where you get fitter and fitter and fitter, then you sort of fall off a cliff in an unexpected way. And I know you guys are, are quite familiar with that phenomenon. I was also surrounded by other athletes who, you know, I felt like undertrained or misinterpret fitness peaks or didn't necessarily understand the importance of recovery. They got injured. And so at, at that point in time, I became very personally interested in what did it mean to actually be optimal? What did it mean to train effectively? And this led me down a, a physiology path that led me to doing a lot of physiology research while I was in school. I was technically studying government and economics while I was at Harvard, and I ended up spending a lot of time in the science department, which was unfamiliar territory. And I would say that whole process of, of learning and, and researching and, and really recognizing my own limitations as an athlete or an individual uh, got me interested in this idea of consistency and, and from a WHOOP standpoint, this idea of, of recovery. So, Will, I'm fascinated by the idea that you started your business then that by identifying a problem. You know, in your case, it was burning out, having overtrained, and then the curiosity to go and look for a solution. So can you explain why you think that's so important um, for any business to identify a problem and then look for the solution? Well, I meet a lot of entrepreneurs, founders, CEOs now at, at my stage in, in building a company. And I'm always, I always find it's, it's, uh, it's easier to build a business if you're obsessed with the problem more so than the upside of building a company. I do meet young people who say, you know, I want to start a company. What, what should I start or how can I start something? And in my case, I, I became so obsessed with this problem that starting a company was like the last step in that in that evolution. I, I became an entrepreneur well before I even knew what an entrepreneur was. And so I, I tend to find that, that if you become really obsessed with the problem, that's what will pull you through in the end. And it'll help you over, overcome enormous challenges along the way. It'll help you really define what it is that you're after. It'll help you, uh, you know, create a culture that's around solving that problem, being very mission driven yeah. versus say, uh, you know, I want to make a big buck. And, uh, and so I, I like to gravitate towards entrepreneurs who are uh, focused on solving a specific problem. 
So can you tell us about what some of those problems that you experienced were? Well, overtraining was probably the main lens that I was looking at it from. You know, why is it that some days uh, I felt like I could just keep training and training and training, and then some days somewhat randomly it seemed like, you know, it'd be hard to play a single game. And, uh, and why did it also seem somewhat random how I felt on the day of matches, which is, of course, when you wanted to feel your peak. And so that just got me sort of interested in a very specific question, which is how, how could I know how hard I should train before I trained? And why wasn't that something that was sort of commonly recognized as important? The, the thing that was confusing in all this is when I would talk to other athletes about it, or even talk to coaches. And I'd say, you know, if you could have technology, you could have tools to, to better help you understand training or performance, what would you want? I th- Athletes, especially coaches too, were hyper focused on how they could get more information about exercise specifically. Uh, we want sweat analysis. We want better video analysis. We want better positional analysis. We want more stats about the performance itself. And yet, when I asked them, "Well, what problems are you facing?" they often were reciting things back to me that I felt as a, you know personally as an athlete. Oh, well, we deal with injuries. We deal with player availability. We deal with athletes not training properly on the right days. And so I thought there was a real mismatch between what the market, so to speak, at the time was saying and the problems that they were actually facing. And this is a good lesson, I think, for entrepreneurs too, which is customers are much better at describing their problems than giving you the solutions to those problems. And if you're an entrepreneur, you want to really listen closely to what the problem actually is. And then in turn, do your very best to create the appropriate solution to that problem. So I thought the problem to overtraining was actually understanding everything outside of exercise too. What are you doing the other 20 hours of the day? How are you sleeping? How are you recovering? And it turned out that was also going to be a really good way to continuously understand the body and to be able to understand all sorts of things as it relates to health. Let's well, just that, make it clear I'm for sure. people, Will, you know, what we're talking about here, which is Whoop, which is wearable tech that you created. Um, Damon and I have been lucky enough to use them ourselves. And the feedback is amazing. So if you listen to this and you're not aware of whoop yet, um, obviously you can find all the information online, but basically you wear it and it tells you your HRV, which is effectively how well you're recovering. Um, so how hard you can train. And then when you do train, it lets you know whether you've trained enough or not trained enough. It measures your sleep, not just how much, but exactly how you're sleeping, the type of sleep you're having. And I remember once I was feeling a bit under the weather, um, and it came up with 4% recovery, Will. So I woke up and I was due to go to the gym after the school run at 9 a.m. Look at your eyes widened. You're like, 4%? What, how ill were you? There you and go. I, thought, I was like, I don't feel great. But I just checked my, you know, obviously you go on your phone and you check your, your the feedback from the Whoop band and 4% recovery. And I was on the phone to my PT. I said, like, not today because I just need a rest day. So you were a focused, driven athlete with grand ambitions, I'm sure, for a successful sports career like lots of college athletes have when you got the answer that doing less was the answer how did you cope with that because I think that is an issue that so many people have not just people in sport but people in business people in life people who are parenting they feel like they're not going at 100 percent 100 percent of the time then they're letting themselves and others around them down well I think it's a challenge for a lot of hard driving people you know hard driving people have a mindset that allows them to push much further than their body's capable of. And often that's a great asset, but it also is in turn what can cause overtraining, fatigue, burnout if you're an executive. And at least for me personally, becoming uh, fascinated by sleep and recovery was a real uh, a mindset shift. You know, less it's not necessarily do less when it comes to exercise or strain or even stress that you're trying to take on. I mean, in many ways, I think success is overcoming a level of stress that would break most people. So in order to take that stress on, you need to be really well recovered. And in in a way, it, it got me to think about, well, what are all the ways that I can be better recovered? How can I 
get more sleep? How can I be more calm in these pressure moments? And that translated much better to a business career than, than anything else. So what sort of tips then, Will, did you pick up then on, on how you could maximize that respite, those rest periods? Oof, well, we could go down quite a rabbit hole here. <laughs> the first thing I'll say for your audience is that um, sleep is fairly misunderstood. People who have never measured their sleep, if you ask them how much sleep they got last night, they'll say, well, I went to bed at 11 and I woke up at six, so I got seven hours of sleep. That's pretty good, right? In reality, they spent seven hours in bed, right? And as you guys know from Wearing Whoop, if you spend seven hours in bed, that's going to consist of four different periods. It's going to consist of the time that you're awake. It's going to consist of time that you're in light sleep. It's going to consist of time that you're in REM sleep and slow wave sleep. Those are the four different periods. Now, REM sleep and slow wave sleep are where all the magic happens. Awake and light sleep, you don't really get much credit from those from a physiological standpoint, right? REM sleep is when your mind is repairing. So that's cognitive repair. It's also when you're in a deep dream state. So any high-performing executive, anyone who's got to do uh, you know, real cognitive work, uh, which is really every human in my opinion, needs to get REM sleep. Uh, uh, slow wave sleep, deep sleep, that's when your body produces about 95% of its human growth hormone. And, uh, and so there's this sort of misconception that, you know, you're getting stronger in the gym or you're getting stronger during practice. For the most part, you're breaking muscles down that then repair during slow wave sleep. So let's now go back to this person who spent seven hours in bed. That person could have spent a total of 30 minutes in REM and slow wave sleep, or that person could have spent five and a half hours in REM and slow wave sleep. Now, that's a world of difference, right? The person who's getting 30 minutes versus five and a half hours is living a completely different life. I mean, it's so hard to understate the, the, the profound difference in those, in those people's lives and the way that their body's recovering and the, their, their body's sort of resilience to just take on the world. And a lot of what I've done as an entrepreneur, but also a lot of what Whoop does as a product is it tries to help you figure out what are all the different things, it could be lifestyle decisions, could be diet, could be mindset, could be training, whatever, that help you optimize the more time that you spend in REM and slow wave. Because again, we didn't talk about spending more time in bed even. We just said of the time you're going to spend in bed, how do you make it more productive? And I think that's a real key for people. It's not always, oh, just do more of something or do less of something. Sometimes it's taking what you're already doing and making it better. And for sleep, that was, that's been a big focus of mine. And, and it's something that we work with a lot of high-performing executives on and athletes on. And for so our it? listeners, Go on, Jake, sorry. hard over Zoom, isn't it? Go on, sorry. For our listeners then, who want more time in those sleeps that are really good for them, what from what you've learned from you and all of your Whoop customers, what are the things that they need to be doing? Okay, so the, the first one, which is a general one that applies to everyone, is the more um, consistently you can sleep, the better. So sleep consistency is this notion of going to bed and waking up at the same time. So going to bed at 11 p.m. and waking up at 6 a.m. and doing that almost every day or close to it. You, you, your body gets a physiological boost when you go to bed and wake up at the same time. So even if you're spending less hours in bed, as long as you consistently do them at the same time, you have a positive physiological response. This gets more complicated if you travel a lot. We can get into that sort of nuance. So sleep consistency is really important. As a general rule, being um, more hydrated and not eating within three hours of bedtime that tends to help from a diet standpoint. This is, this is a little bit personal in that some people can get away with eating pretty close to bed, but for the most part, I would guess about 90% of people uh, eating within three hours of bedtime tends to disrupt your sleep. Uh, alcohol, unfortunately, is just not good. Uh, so the less alcohol you can drink, the better. If you're going to drink alcohol, uh, it's sort of crescendo. It goes um, wine. And then clear liquors tend to be better than dark liquors. So, so there you have it on alcohol. Uh, as you get 
closer to bed having less blue light. So, uh, you know, within say 30 minutes of, of going to bed, uh, ideally you're not uh, being exposed to a lot of different screens, cell phone, television, laptop. As an entrepreneur, I'm actually someone who's constantly looking at my phone. And uh, what I do to get away with that is I wear blue light blocking glasses before I go to bed. So those make a big difference. Uh, you generally uh, want to sleep in a cold room, a dark room, uh, have high quality air if you can. You want the room to not be noisy. Uh, those are those are sort of all uh, you know generally positive things. And then you know mindset helps a lot. So making sure that you're not you know getting in some kind of a verbal outbreak with your partner or reading the wrong thing right before you close your eyes. Those tend to not help your your overall sleep quality. Uh, supplements varies by person. I, I like taking a lot of magnesium before I go to bed. And on, I would say a few nights a week, I take a little bit of melatonin. Brilliant. So and how much of this is consistent with, you mentioned earlier um, around some of the elite athletes that you're fortunate enough to work with that also use the Whoop brand. What ideas and techniques have you picked up off them that, that you could share with our listeners in terms of driving for this high performance? Well, I, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of things come to mind. I think the thing that I've taken most um, from, from the, the world's best athletes personally is, is just the general mindset that they have towards greatness. They, they do a, a phenomenal job um, staying present uh, in the sense that they are hyper-focused in the moment on being great. And they don't spend a lot of time really reflecting um, from a nostalgia standpoint. And in a way, it seems they're almost driven to a fault. And the ones who tend to be happiest in being driven to a fault also have some form of gratitude that they bring into their life. So they're simultaneously hungry and they're on that you know, dopamine train of, I need to win the next thing, while also being grateful for their success. And that's actually a hard combination. I think many high-performing athletes and high-performing even entrepreneurs uh, struggle with being grateful in a sense that it would somehow make them complacent and that in a way it would make them less hard-charging. So that, that general mindset, I would say, is one of the biggest things I've picked up from, from professional athletes and, and particularly the world's best. I would say that also they, they are incredibly focused on, uh, recovery. And, you know, there's this sort of over-focus, I think from, from a fan standpoint of what athletes are doing during games. And I think there's an under-focus on what they're doing in the other 20 hours. And, uh, and the world's best athletes are competing every minute of the day. They treat themselves like professional athletes when they wake up in the morning, when they go to a restaurant, when they go to a bar, when they're hanging out with people, right? They keep thinking about themselves as professional athletes. And I think that that's a bit of a misconception uh, for, for uh, people who are earlier in their careers or, or maybe not uh, quite as successful as, as they want to be as pro athletes. So can I ask you then, Will, in terms of how, how much of this transfers into your own practice now as, a, as an entrepreneur? So we're talking about those, those sort of... Uh, elite athletes in a competitive domain, but how much of it does it transfer to you as a entrepreneur into your life? It's, I mean, look, it's, it's, it's helped enormously. I, I also host the podcast, so I get to interview them and, 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 you know, have conversations like the one we're having right now, where you spend a lot of time, hopefully listening and, and sort of generally curious so that that's, that that's helped me absorb a lot of the information that you otherwise, you know, may less, let drift past you. I, I think uh, I got very focused on this need for, for being more grateful in my life, you know, and, and really emphasizing that. I also, uh, in, for the last seven years, have, have meditated every single day. When I was about 24 years old, I think I, I kind of felt like I had reached a moment of crisis in running the company. I was a 24 year old CEO. I had maybe 25 people working for me. I had raised about $10 million from investors and all of that felt completely overwhelming. And I felt like I was failing as a, 
uh, as an entrepreneur and as a leader. And, and I just was overwhelmed with stress. I was drinking too much. Like I just did, I wasn't, I wasn't in sync, you know, I, I didn't feel like my, my body was well balanced and my mind was, was where it needed to be. And, and that led me to, to meditation where I, you know, really developed a, a, a daily practice and it, it really transformed uh, my life in a lot of ways positively. And it helped me, uh, I think, be more present. It helped me be more grateful. And then, you know, in the years to come, as we've got more and more successful, you know, going from the business being worth hundreds of millions of dollars to now uh, $3.6 billion, you know, just being able to, to appreciate that while also still staying motivated to keep charging and, uh, and I think that sort of sense of balance came in large part from from learning to meditate and and uh, and being a little bit more uh, present. I really want people listening to this, Will, to understand the possibilities that are out there for them, because I think it's easy for some of them to be driving to work. You know, it might be they're listening to this in a country where the, you know, the rain's coming down and they're doing a job they don't necessarily love. And they hear this and they think, great, you hang out with these elite athletes. You've built a business worth over 3 billion and you find time to meditate every day. That's not my life. Do you really believe that anyone can be as successful as you, that they can build a business based really on passion, which is what you've created? Do you think that's there for anyone? I do. I think you have to be obsessed with a problem. I think you have to be willing to sacrifice an enormous amount. I think you have to be willing to overcome a, uh, an incredible degree of, of pain and sort of personal uh, anxiety along the way. But look, you know, you can, you can build your, your dream job. You know, I think, I think building a business is much harder than you think it will be but it's not nearly as hard as what everyone will tell you it is, which is to say that it's impossible. I remember when I was starting Whoop, it was everyone telling me I was going to fail and it was impossible. And frankly, it was a really hard, it was just really hard dealing with that. Like I put up a real wall to that feedback and, uh, and the truth is it was just a lot harder, but it wasn't impossible. So I want to pick up on a few things there. The first one is you mentioned about anxiety. What created that? And for our listeners, perhaps more importantly, what did you do to overcome it? Well, you know, it's, I want to be careful not to mix these words too much. There's sort of some combination of anxiety or stress or feeling down on yourself. There's a mixture of that and even nerves, you could argue, mm. you know, standing in front of 20 people or 50 people or 600 people who now work for you and they've left jobs elsewhere to come be on this mission with you, right? Uh, how do you cope with that? How do you manage that? And for me, uh, it was staying very mission driven. It was being very honest with myself about what I thought I was excelling at and were areas that I needed to bring in business partners or complementary uh, points of view. Uh, it was trying to stay humble about the success that we'd had along the way. And, and then I, I go back to, you know, so the, the whole notion of, uh, of treating yourself as a professional athlete, being well rested, meditating, exercising every day, mm -hmm. uh, you know, having good relationships in your personal life. These things all, all matter, in my opinion, for how you perform as a leader. And those people that were telling you in the early days, ah, this isn't going to happen. You know, the odds of creating a successful business out of this is, is negligible. You know, the tech's really hard to create. Everyone's tried it. Blah. Two things, I suppose. Number one, how did you learn to not listen to those? But also, like, why do we talk to each other like that? What is the benefit of telling anyone at any point that their dream and their great ambition is not gonna is not gonna be a success? It's like it doesn't solve any problems for you, and I don't think it does much for them either. You know. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of it came in the form of what people thought was helpful advice. Right. Um, but Aha, yes, <laughs> you know, and therein lies the challenge for young people too. Is is they're kind of at a vulnerable stage in their early twenties or even mid or late twenties when they're still thinking about what they want to do with their career and they're going around asking people for perspectives. In my case, I was also raising capital, so 
it becomes a little bit more of a transactional relationship, which is why I think many people told me so bluntly they thought I was going to fail. Um, to answer your question, I, you know, one thing that was uh, that just became a coping me mechanism was effectively just putting up a wall to this negative feedback, and that. Uh, there was really two reasons for that. One is that if I actually listened to all that feedback, I, I don't think I would have been able to get out of bed in the morning because it just would have been overwhelmingly negative. But two, and this took longer to unravel, you know, I, I at that early stage in building Whoop really tied my own individual performance to that of the company's performance. If, if Whoop was doing well, I was doing well. If Whoop was doing poorly, I was doing poorly. If Whoop was failing, I was failing as an entrepreneur. And that's a, that's a super un, unhealthy uh, relationship to create in your mind. I don't know if it was in part because I was um, a young entrepreneur and this was really the first thing I had done in my career. It was my first job, if you will. Or if that's something that most entrepreneurs face when they're building a company because they've become so obsessed with it. But it was certainly the case for me. And uh, and the thing that it takes a long time to realize, and it took me doing work on myself to realize, is that uh, those are really two independent things. There can be all sorts of reasons why your business is succeeding or failing. And if you actually just focus on your own individual performance and just keep thinking about how can I get a little better every single day, you know, independent from what the outcomes of the company... Uh, one, you're in a much better headspace, and and uh, you know, two, you, you wake up ten years later, and you're actually now in a position to be running a company of hundreds of people and managing hundreds of millions of dollars and this and that. Whereas at an earlier stage, you felt like you couldn't even manage, you know, ten or twenty people. So tell us, Will, how do you stay humble when you're so successful as as you are now? And how do you stay optimistic when things weren't so good? What were what were some of the specific techniques you use? Well, one very key uh, technique was just visualizing what I expected the business to do or uh, to grow to. In in a lot of cases, especially with the product, uh, building the technology for Whoop, if people aren't familiar was very hard. And, and a lot of what we were, we were doing or did had never been done before. So there was an existential question of, can we actually build this? And that for an entrepreneur is scary. And, and you also have to manage a team around uh, overcoming challenges. And you have to have this sort of mindset that there's, there's no such thing as a failure along the way. You're sort of just finding new ways that it didn't quite work the way you expected, right? You're constantly reframing things in your mind towards what that, that end goal is that you're visualizing towards. And I recognized, and recognize now looking back on this, some of this came somewhat naturally to me and, and it was just sort of my coping mechanism for moving forwards uh, despite uh, feeling pressure or, or feeling overwhelmed. I, I think it also helps a lot to have, uh, you know, a team around you that, that you believe in and, and consequently they believe in you and building that camaraderie, because of course it's easier to take on challenges with a team or together, if you will, than it is to take them on alone. And certainly the success of whoop is the success of, of many people working very hard together. Let's talk then about building a team. There are many people that listen to this from head teachers of schools to people that run businesses with one or two members of staff. Uh, we have a lot of sports teams and sports franchises that share this in the dressing rooms and, and in the training facilities. To build a team is what they're all trying to do. How do you do it? Well, I, I, I realized along the way that I, I looked for a very specific type of person. Uh, to bring onto my team. Uh, and that was uh, someone who embodied high humility and high intensity. Uh, you know, high, high intensity, we'll start there, is you know, being hard driving, uh, having a, maybe a deep expertise in a particular area and, and uh, sort of a rel relentlessness, if you will, to want to explore that and, uh, and better at that. High humility is recognizing that in that pursuit, you don't necessarily have all the answers. And uh, when you're building an ambitious 
company that's that's operating across a lot of different disciplines, what often happens is you'll have one individual representing an entire department. So let's take a specific example. Okay, the whoop strap. How does it send data from the whoop strap to your iPhone? Okay, well, that meeting is going to include a hardware engineer, a signal processing engineer, an iOS engineer, a product manager, a designer, and maybe someone from marketing. Okay, that group of people is going to decide how it sends data. And guess what? They're all going to come in with their own point of view on it. And there's going to be this natural collision, right? And that's that's sort of the beauty of, of a high intensity workplace where people are really passionate. But what happens often if everyone also brings a level of humility to that conversation is that you know everyone gets focused on figuring out what's the best solution for the company, not I came up with it. And uh, and so I've I found that that having people who are high intensity and high humility, uh, you know, we're the best problem solvers for our organization. And what in turn that also helped us develop was a was a culture that's uh, more of an idea meritocracy, because when you enter uh, a workplace or a culture where you feel like you can challenge anyone and you can confront anyone and, and it's ultimately about coming up with the, the best ideas, um, it allows you to, to operate at this real freedom. And, and for the organization's benefit, it means that your best ideas might come from a VP or they might come from an intern. And we've had both. And that's, that's pretty exciting. And that's pretty exciting for anyone in the org to feel. And, uh, and so, you know, as a consequence of this, um, you know, high, high intensity, high humility group of people, we've also been able to build a culture that I think is a high, um, um, an, uh, an idea meritocracy. So that sounds like, I've read a great quote from you when you were talking about your parents and you said that line about your mother was book smart, but your dad was street smart which taps into that idea of real cognitive diversity, people coming at a problem from different angles and different solutions. Can you break down though for us, Will, for people listening to this, what are the kind of rules of debating or the rules of coming together for a meeting that anyone could take and get the best out of all those different perspectives that you use in, uh, in your own culture? Well, I don't know if I've ever defined rules in, in that sense, but I'll try to think about them uh, here with you guys in real time. You know, what one general theme I, I would say is uh, you want to embrace chaos, but you don't you don't want any sense of drama. So I'm pro chaos. I hate drama. And that's one very key point of view, I think, if you're going to have a debate culture which is that you're going to allow people to be bouncing off each other. You're going to allow there to be this collision, but it's not going to get personal and it's not going to be about the politics of an organization or who's going to get promoted or who feels this way or that. It's really going to be about the topic at hand. I think that's probably one of the most key things. I think you also want to make sure that you have an environment in which it's clear people are actually listening to each other and they're prepared you know, uh, if there's a, uh, uh, a draft document for a business proposal, you know, everyone should have read the business proposal before they show up to the meeting. If someone's giving a, an explanation for something over Zoom, hopefully the three people listening aren't also on, you know, uh, Slack messaging other people, but they're actually paying attention. So those are some of the quick things that come to mind. And then I think you know, the last point, which is maybe lost the most in all of this, is once you do come to a solution, you have to agree to commit to it. Uh, and, and in some cases, there may still be individuals who slightly disagree or strongly disagree with the decision that's made. And you still have to, you know, agree to that. You have to sort of agree to disagree and move forwards. And, and that, I think, is a, another key attribute. And how are you with creating a vulnerable culture? Because it, it struck me that when you were talking about, you know, a conversation about getting the info from the strap to the iPhone, right? There's people in that room that know things. And I hope I'm not being rude here, Will. They know things you're probably never going to know. So you're sitting there thinking, okay, there's lots of knowledge and lots of learning in the room. 
you can't possibly know everything. So how are you with making sure that people are vulnerable, that people could admit they don't know certain things to admit to their mistakes? Because I think creating a vulnerable workplace is as important as creating a successful one. I agree with that. Look, you want to be very uh, intellectually honest about what you think you know and why. And you also want people to be able to push up against that and, and question why you feel so strongly you know something. I think vulnerability often starts at the top. I mean, it, it's no secret that uh, I'm a 31-year-old uh, CEO. This isn't just the first company I started. It's my first job. Uh, we're operating at the intersection of technology and medicine and research. And I'm, you know, I, I, I didn't study engineering or computer science. I'm not a doctor. Um, I'm not technically a researcher by trade. So I'm operating in fields that uh, I have to rely on on the people around me and embrace the people around me and and hopefully empower the people around me. I think if there's one thing I've I've done well, it's find exceptional people and empower them to tell us what to do. So how do you manage then in terms of the nature of the product that uh, that Whoop is, Will? How do you manage intensity in your staff without them risking burnout and some of those other um, consequences of that, that that we often associate with with that term burnout? Well, you, you build it into the culture. I mean, Whoop, for example, has a sleep bonus. If you get over 85% of your sleep performance in a month, Brilliant. you get a bonus every month on your paycheck. <laughs> Wow. So we actually we actually pay you to sleep. If you have a red recovery, uh, and this was especially effective during the sort of the, the height of COVID, uh, we ask that you don't come into the office Brilliant. and you work from home. Uh, people, people have red recoveries. They either may be getting sick or they may be at greater risk to get sick. So it's, you know, in their advantage and others to stay home. We have... Uh, all kinds of fitness classes that we do together. We're on whoop teams together where we're looking at each other's data. It's, it's sort of out there in the open Brilliant. Uh, in a healthy way. We were joined on the podcast, Will, by a lady called Susie Ma, who is uh, an entrepreneur that created a skincare brand called Tropic. And she said that one of her defining things is to have the infinite purpose for her life and for her, for her business. And we've created one for high performance we have an infinite purpose so it has no end and it's it's what we're all about how would you describe the infinite purpose of whoop i think it's to improve health i mean you put you put on a, a whoop and within a year you're sleeping longer you're sleeping more consistently you have a lower resting heart rate you have a higher heart rate variability and you've probably made at least three meaningful lifestyle shifts, whether that's drinking a little less alcohol or finding the right diet for you or introducing something like mindfulness. And I get to hear from Whoop members every single day who the product has meaningfully changed their behavior and improved their health. So that's, that's an enormously rewarding feeling. And uh, to your point about infinite possibility, it doesn't feel like that's ever not going to be a good cause to fight for. So what's the future looking like then of tracking technology? Because I think it's in a really interesting place now. It's already helping people to live that more optimal life. What, do, what does it look like in, in 20 or 30 years? Well, I don't even know if you have to look that far out. I think most people are grossly underestimating the degree to which wearable technology is going to change healthcare and dramatically improve health broadly because V1 of wearables, to put it, politely was kind of underwhelming. You had these sort of step step counters that, you know, vaguely told you information that you needed to know, but didn't really action on any of it. And, you know, V2 of wearable technology, which I like to think Whoop is, is out in front of, is now able to tell you exactly what to do, tell you how to recover, tell you how to train, tell you when to go to bed. It's much more actionable. Uh, and it's even on that cusp of telling you really interesting things you don't know at all. 
you know, for example, tens of thousands of people on Whoop discovered they had COVID-19 through their own Whoop data, wow. you know, before they actually got tested, right? That's a pretty profound uh, recognition. We've had people on Whoop realize they had different diseases because their data was so off that they went to go see a doctor. We've had people on Whoop literally go to the ER because they realized they were having a heart attack because of their Whoop data. Now, if you think about what that could demonstrate for going forwards, I think our technology will have the ability to predict disease states, predict you're going to have a heart attack. You know, forget going to see a doctor on a random day of the year for an annual checkup. How about you need to go see a doctor in the next 15 minutes, right? Like how game changing would that be uh, for you and also for the healthcare system? I mean, the healthcare system, especially in the United States, is totally screwed up. And it's screwed up because it's really uh, curative costs versus preventative costs. And when you can shift curative costs to being preventative costs, the whole system changes. And I think wearable technology, and, and I expect Whoop, uh, will play a big role in that shift. So when Jake and I have interviewed other entrepreneurs similar to yourself, then, Will, like one of the things we we notice is that they always have an organization that complies with what we call the t-shirt law. The idea that they communicate what their business does on the front of a t-shirt so everyone can understand it and buy into it. So what's the t-shirt law for Whoop then that, that, that you can get this out to even more people and understand those benefits you've just shared with us? Well, our mission at Whoop is to unlock human performance. So pretty, pretty straight into the point, especially for this podcast, you know, uh, what that also means is, you know, how do you change your behavior to improve your performance? How do you make just true health improvement part of your performance? Uh, but ultimately human performance in that context is, uh, living a healthier and longer life. You know, we're going to move on in a minute. Will, on to our, um, our quick fire questions at the end. But I just keep coming back to the same thing while we're talking, which is I really want people listening to this to understand that they might have this great desire to run a business, be an entrepreneur, be better at the job they have, be better parents, whatever it is. And it's almost like from what you've learned from the athletes you hang out with to creating tech like this, adopting the habits now for living where you want to be in six months or six years is the most important thing rather than kind of waiting until that success comes and then go, right, now I'm going to live like a successful person. Now I'm going to put my body and my mind at the forefront of my thinking. It's the total opposite, isn't it? Yeah, that's such a good point. You know, it goes back to the beginning of the conversation where we talked a little bit about consistency, making a slight shift and then doing it consistently, consistently for a long period of time has unbelievable compounding benefits. I mean, for me, just meditating 20 minutes a day, but doing that every single day for seven years, it completely changed my disposition and my attitude as a leader and the way I thought about my own life. And that's just 20 minutes a day of doing something versus nothing, right? And it's helped me grow into uh, being a successful uh, business leader or being able to be a successful business leader. I, I think there's so many great examples of that, you know, um, we talked a little bit about how you can do that with sleep. What are a few very simple things you can change? I mean, maybe just make your room colder, you know, maybe put your phone down five minutes before bed versus looking at it up until the last second, maybe we're in blue light blocking classes. Like people need to be willing to experiment a little more with their, with their, their lives and their bodies and their attitudes and, and be willing to see where that takes them. Uh, at least for me, that's been an, an enormously important uh, piece of my growth is uh, being experimental and and seeing where that takes me. That's a good point. Just actually, while we're talking about it, just think how many people we know that are living the same life now that they were living five years ago. I had a conversation with someone about this last week. I was like, you're in the same place without, ex without exploring, without experimenting. It doesn't happen. It's true. So what is the one thing that you would recommend for our listeners right now from all those changes, all that exploring and experimenting that you've done, where should they begin? What's the one thing? Well, I think a lot of this, this whole discussion comes back to what do you want? 
you know, I, I think people often are frustrated that they're not getting what they want without actually having clearly defined what it is that they want. Mm. And if you just sort of think about a simple method in your mind, ask yourself, what do you really want in life? And then come up with a process for achieving it. And without the first step, it's hard to come up with the second or assess the second as, as obvious and simple as that sounds. I, I experience this a lot with uh, entrepreneurs who come to me saying, you know, we're, we're frustrated about this, this, and this, and then we're trying to build this business. And I say, well, what do you actually want for the business right now? What are the three things that you want? And if that's not well articulated in your mind, it's a little bit harder, I think, to, to find a process. If you said, look, I want to lose 20 pounds. I want that. Okay, boom, let's come up with a process for that, right? Uh, so I think that, that, that having a clear definition in, in, in the moment for what you want is, is, uh, is core because there's a lot of sacrifices that may also come from that one, that one thought or that one, uh, that one, uh, need. I, th I think I read somewhere, uh, uh, a desire is a contract with yourself to be unhappy until you get with what you want, something like that. Now it's a, that's a little depressing, but it's it's a helpful lens to think about how many deci desires you actually want to have at one time. Yeah, you know, the, the more singular they are, the easier it is to achieve them. For the last ten years, I've been incredibly focused on building this company. I have not had a lot of other, you know, wants in my life. It's really been this, and in some ways, that's helped build the company. So one of the things that. Um... I've heard you speak about as well then, Will, is the idea of, of, of focusing on stopping doing things, almost having a stop doing list as much as a start doing list. And that fits in with this idea of a singular focus. So how important is it that you regularly sort of clear the clutter from your life and how do you go about doing that? I think it's critically important. I mean, a lot of destructive behaviors you'd hope you could stop, uh, you know, people who maybe have trouble with binge drinking or smoking or overeating, et cetera, right? Like if you can remove some of those uh, just as a baseline, obviously you're in a better place. Some people may be at a stage in their life where they say, I just want to have the most fun possible. That's what I want. And okay, like, you know, then, then you may not view those as destructive behaviors. You may be in a different place in life. Uh, but for people who are listening to this, who are really focused on high performance, it'd be worth listing out all the things that you think may undermine your high performance. And look, some of those might be relationships, you know, so this, you kind of have to have some hard conversations with yourself if you're going to go through that exercise. But uh, I think you make a great point, uh, Damien, it's a critical, it's a critical list to be considering. And just before we hit our quick fire questions, I want to come back to your quote about desire as a contract you make with yourself to be unhappy until you get what you want. I've always believed that desire is everything that you need to be successful. The desire comes before the success, no? Well, I, I think I'm, I'm more inclined to, to, to take your quote, actually. <laughs> I, I, I mostly was, I was making a bit of a stubborn point, which is that you want to be very decisive about the things in your life that you're you're orienting yourself towards yeah and i think for the most part uh desires can be highly motivating they can be very clarifying uh it's just you want to be mindful of how many of them at the same time are you after and how are those pulling at each other it's all about uh, i guess we could reframe it as something like desire with no steps towards achieving that aim is a contract you make with yourself to be unhappy because it's all the desire is fine. As long as you make the effort right to achieve them. I think that's right. Interesting. So, so go if we could go into a quick fire round then, Will. Oh, yeah. we normally finish our interviews with a series of quick fire questions. So the first one is, can you list the three non-negotiable behaviors that you and the people around you must buy into? Well, we talked about high intensity. I think that's critical, you know, being hard driving, relentless. We talked about high humility, the, you know, the recognition that you, you, you don't have all the answers. And I, I think I would add from a team standpoint, uh, you know, a sense of loyalty. 
uh, a commitment to one another that you're in it together and uh, and you're going to persevere together. Nice. Well, if you could go back to one period in your life, where would you go and why? I would say right here now, you know, I, the big focus in the last 10 years for me has been on being present and the importance of being present. And I think the more present you get, the more fulfilling your life feels and the better you perform. So right here, right now. How important is legacy to you? Legacy in the sense that I've helped build products or teams that live on well past me. Uh, I would say quite important. You know, I like the idea of of being able to create things uh, from scratch and have those things be contributing value uh, well beyond my existence. Legacy from the sense of uh, who was Will Ahmed. I I don't know. I haven't I haven't thought enough about that, but. I guess I like the trajectory that I'm on and, and I'm mostly focused on, on kind of keep going. Uh, the last hour has been full of brilliant takeaways and lessons for our listeners. If you could recommend though one book or maybe another podcast series, apart from your own, obviously, which you're welcome to plug again, or a TV series, something that you've absorbed that made a difference to you that you'd love to pass on to our listeners. Well, I'd love to plug the podcast for a second. You know, the, the, the one thing I'll say about having done a podcast and I'm curious if it's like the same for you guys is the process of, of actually interviewing people for an hour is a really important process for learning how to listen. You know, you have to be incredibly present as you guys have been, and you have to really listen. And, uh, and so for me personally, having done, having gone through that exercise of doing a podcast, I, you know, I said, we'll do 10 and see how it goes. And now we're on, I don't know, 130 or something. And, uh, but just having gone through that process of, of having to really listen to people and think about what they've said and ask follow-up questions and ask follow-up questions. Cause as you guys know, depth is kind of the, where all the magic happens. Yeah. Uh, and that's been an incredibly useful process for me personally. And so this is a di slightly different answer to your question, but I would encourage people to think about ways in their life that they are forced to uh, listen to people really deeply and to, uh, to ask questions and follow up on them and think about them. Yeah. I, I think the thing for us with creating high performance is you realize everyone has got something of value for somebody else and i think we all just live in this world don't we where we float past everyone and actually if you stop and engage them and really as you say get to the deep stuff really understand what motivates them it, it it's magic magic for so many people 100 percent. so the final question then will is what's your one golden rule for our listeners to live a high performance life uh, i think it, it's com combining uh purpose with consistency you know back to your original point of what is high performance i think it's an exceptional output delivered consistently over time a lot of my life has been learning that and wrestling with that and especially as an entrepreneur being someone who has the same consistent performance every day and being a predictable outcome as a result for the rest of my team and my investors and my shareholders and, and our customers, you know, maintaining that, that consistency, I think is so key. It's brilliant. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. I, I'm always very aware, aware when we have these conversations with someone like you that has built a business valued at over $3 billion, that it's very easy for people to listen and think, well, you know, that is so far away from where I am in my life. Um, and I don't want people to think we're having this conversation because anyone can then just go and do that. Although, you know, the possibility is there. I think that's the lesson here for people is that it's not about that end goal and that big moment. It's about the everyday, tiny, small details, the little processes. If you can get those right, you might build a $3 billion company, but you might just be happier or healthier or able to run after your kids a bit longer in the park. And that in itself is, is well worth doing, you know? Well, yeah. And to, to your point, that those numbers are also a little misleading in the sense that I was struggling more with, with running a $10 million company than I am now with struggle, you know, with managing a, a multi-billion dollar company. And 
I think a lot of a, the theme today was what are the the little things that you're doing to grow into a larger role or, or to become a slightly better version of yourself. And so for me, it was putting a lot of those practices in play and then the, the business in a way actually followed, but it's not, don't, don't feel like because you're having a hard time running your two person company that you have no chance of being able to build a big business. A lot of it is getting comfortable in that moment so that you can then grow into it. There you go. Everything you now find easy, you once found hard, right? For sure. Will, thank you so much. Thank you, Will. That's been incredible. Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community.